World News Today, brought to you by Admiral Corporation in behalf of Admiral distributors and dealers all over America and in many foreign lands. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations and leading news centers in our own country, CBS reporters are waiting to bring you first-hand news from the world's political and battlefronts. Now, here's Douglas Edwards. American troops on Leyte Island in the Philippines now hold Tacloban, the island's capital, its airfield, and the town of Dulag, 20 miles to the south. The Russians have made new progress in Hungary and in East Prussia. In Western Europe, General Patton's Third Army is on the attack. In the Aegean, the British have landed on the island of Lemnos. And now, news direct from correspondents abroad. For our first report, Admiral takes you to Pacific Fleet Headquarters at Pearl Harbor. Webley Edwards reporting. According to reports from the Philippines, the operation is proceeding nicely with the capital of Leyte Island, Tacloban, and its important 6,000-foot airstrip now in our possession. Reports from the Philippines reveal at least two veteran Pacific Fleet warships, the California and the Pennsylvania, taking part. It's rare that Pacific Fleet ships are mentioned by name during the operation in which they're taking part, but now that the word's out, it gives me a chance to tell a story. The California and the Pensy, you recall, were among the ships damaged in the Pearl Harbor attack. The boys call the Pensy Old Falling Apart because she turns up such a volume of gunfire you'd think she was falling to pieces. Actually, she's solid and sound, although one of the oldest U.S. battle wagons. Recently, in a Pacific bombardment action, somebody yelled at me, Come here and look. The old Pensy's hit and she's on fire. It turned out the old gal shoots so fast and so much that at times she really does look like she's afire. Incidentally, I think this same explosive glare made by some of our warship's own guns has fooled more than one Jap airplane pilot into thinking the ship was burning furiously. All of us who were at Pearl Harbor on that now famous day have a special feeling for the ships that hit the bottom. We watched them come up and go out to do battle. The old ladies, they call them, they're broad-beamed and they're too slow to keep up with the new glamour girls of the fleet, but what sweethearts they are for bombardment. I lived on one during three days of most intense bombardment. It would amaze you if I could tell you the number of 14-inch shells she hurled in three days. When we got through firing, she'd hurled so much steel and explosives, she's ridden a good foot in the water, which is quite a lot for a battleship. The same old wagon is down hitting the Philippines. They go from one bombardment to another, and it's all in the year's work to her crew. When I learned they were going down to hit the Philippines, I said with some excitement that it would be a great show. Said the executive officer, yep, just as a farmer might talk about plowing up the south 40 acres, we got another job of work to do. From the reports, it looks like they did a great job. I expect one of these times in the future when the word is passed that Tokyo will be bombarded, the men of the old battleships will pat the gun turrets and say, well, it looks like we got another job of work to do. This is Webley Edwards at Fleet Headquarters, Pearl Harbor. I return you to Admiral in New York. And now, for a summary of the situation on Europe's eastern front, Admiral takes you to Supreme Allied Headquarters in France, Larry Lasser reporting. Night has fallen over Paris, and the wet chill of European autumn has filled the dark streets. Jeeps and trucks with headlights blazing are rushing through the blacked out streets of Paris, heading for the front, where Supreme Allied Headquarters reports a quickening of the fighting tempo. With the American wedge and the Siegfried Line now securely anchored at Aachen, the British front in Holland has stepped up its activity for the first time since the lull following the British paratroop stand at Arnhem. Today, British infantry launched a fair-sized attack against the dug-in Germans holding the canal-riddled country between the two big Dutch rivers, the Waal and the Lech, as the Rhine is called in Holland. The British Second Army's two simultaneous attacks gained from 1,500 to 2,000 yards since early this morning. This attack was not supported in a big way from the air, and it cannot be called an offensive. It looks as though the British are heading for the Dutch road junction of Hertogenbosch whose capture would put the British Army in a more favorable position for large-scale effort. Right now, the ground in northern Europe is soaked and muddy, especially in Holland. It's not suitable for large-scale military operations that demand coordination between infantry, tanks, and air force. You know, early autumn is Europe's rainy season, and it may be two or three weeks before the ground is dried out and hardened by frost, and before the skies are clear enough for sustained action by our air force. Meantime, the 9th U.S. Air Force is making the area between the Siegfried Line and the Rhine very unhealthy. Patrols of low-flying American fighter bombers 
sweep up and down, gunning and bombing. And the Germans are worried over this threat to the industrially vital Rhineland and Ruhr. For the first time since D-Day, the Luftwaffe has been ordered up to fight off the aggressive American planes. To try to keep our pilots from cutting all the German communications with the Rhineland. But even though they're fighting over their German fatherland, the Luftwaffe cannot prevent those white-starred American planes from slashing at everything that moves in the Rhineland. Mr. Larry, let's start returning you now to Admiral in New York. More news in just a moment, but first, here's Warren Sweeney with a message from Admiral Corporation. When the war is won, you and many thousands of other American homemakers are going to make a wonderful discovery. When you see the new Admiral two-temperature refrigerator, you'll discover that out-of-season fruits and vegetables need no longer be a luxury, that you can buy food in bulk at big savings and store it safely for months. All this will be possible because the Admiral Refrigerator will have a huge home freezer that will freeze foods for long storage, will keep commercially frozen foods perfectly, and will actually make meats more tender. And the roomy, moist, cold compartment eliminates the need for covered dishes. Foods will not dry out, but will stay crisp and fresh. This regular compartment is so much roomier because the space-stealing coils are gone. And naturally, with the frost-collecting coils gone, there won't be the regular messy job of defrosting. There are other outstanding features, too, in the Admiral Two-Temperature Refrigerator. For example, there's Sterilamp, with its amazing ultraviolet ray action to reduce spoilage. And the new Admiral Two-Temperature Refrigerator will be beautiful, newly styled to grace the finest kitchens. Six years of consumer acceptance and approval before the war makes the Admiral Two-Temperature Refrigerator a fit companion for Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Now, here once again is Douglas Edwards. The Germans have not yet told their people that Aachen has surrendered unconditionally. But now for a report from the First Army Front, Admiral takes you to Belgium, Richard C. Hotelet reporting. Standing by Columbia... The thing that's probably aroused most general interest on the American First Army front today has been the number of buzz bombs that came over on their way west. They've taken our attention for a moment off the actual line of battle and focused, focused it on the bigger picture. Right now, as far as we're concerned, we're in the quiet period between two operations. But we're not playing this game of war alone, and it's good to keep an eye on the Germans. We know that the enemy has been very busy also these last six weeks since we first broke the Siegfried line. He's done his utmost to strengthen his defenses, to forced civilian labor digging new gun emplacements and anti-tank ditches. His engineers have even built some new concrete fortifications between us and the Rhine. More German troops have been brought up, infantry, armor, engineers, artillery. And they've been used and partly exhausted in almost daily smear fatal attacks against our key positions. The idea there was the typical German principle of the aggressive defense. The basic plan was to gain time. And when several thousand German troops were told to hold off until the last man, the enemy started propaganda about the so-called bridgehead of Arthur, while Himmler and the other higher commanders sent pep telegrams into the doomed city. But no one said what they wanted to gain time for except vague promises of new divisions and new weapons that would appear if Germany held out until winter. A major of police, a typical SS man whom we caught in Aachen, has admitted to us that the Gestapo was tightening the screws on the officers' corps also to prolong the agony. He said that stern reprisals had been threatened against the family of any officer who now surrendered in violation of orders. The doodlebugs that came over today are no more effective than they've ever been. The new people's divisions don't look like much. If Hitler wants to keep us from breaking through, at least to the Rhine, he'd better produce something really new and much better in a hurry. This is Richard C. Hartlett with the American First Army in Belgium, returning you now to Admiral in New York. Prime Minister Churchill has returned to Britain from his Moscow conferences with Marshal Stalin. For a summary of the news reaching Britain, Admiral takes you to CBS London, Charles Shaw reporting. Mr. Churchill is back in London after his 10-day conference with Marshal Stalin in Moscow. It was announced about an hour ago that the Prime Minister landed at an airfield near London today. He left Moscow on Thursday, and it isn't known at the moment where he has been the last two days. 
the Prime Minister arrived in the uniform of an Air Commodore, and those who were at the airfield said he looked fit and well. If the comments of London newspaper writers are any criterion, Mr. Churchill may well be hailed as a conquering hero when he makes his next public appearance. The newspaper stories, devoid of any amount of detail, are enthusiastic about the conference, especially about the cordiality between Mr. Churchill and Marshal Stalin. One writer says the two statesmen decided that the war in Europe should be concluded this winter. Well, winter won't be over before the end of next March. And naturally, any war leaders who get together plan for the end of the war as soon as possible. Reports of the Churchill-Stalin cordiality, combined with news of allied successes in all theaters of war, no matter how limited, have returned optimism to Britain. For most of this week, we've been hearing reports that there is turmoil inside Germany. During the last week, the British man on the street has been more optimistic about the end of the war than he was a few weeks ago. And yet the horrid news we get is that the Germans are fighting like savages wherever they feel that bitter defense is necessary. And those men who have been in action with the Germans may be dreaming of a white Christmas, but not at home or in a post-armistice area. I return you now to Admiral. The British broom sweeping the Germans out of the Aegean has reached the northern extremity with a landing on the strategic island of Limnos, guarding the entrance to the Dardanelles. A Royal Navy communique announced today the capture of the port of Mudros on the south coast of the island after a fierce 30-hour battle. 400 prisoners were taken. Limnos has an area of 150 square miles. Well, Marshal Stalin announces new progress by the Red Army in Hungary. For details, Admiral takes you now to CBS Moscow, George Morad reporting. This week, the people of Russia have been told, perhaps more thoroughly than ever before, about the problems and prospects of the post-war world. And optimism is high. While the depressing Polish question is still in flux, the people here know that Marshal Stalin broke all precedent in his personal friendship for Mr. Churchill. But he sat with him in the Emperor's box at the Bolshoi Theater, dined at the British Embassy, and went out in the rain at the airport to see him off. No one doubts that in the light of personal friendship, the bonds are gratefully strengthened between these two strangely dissimilar characters. This thought, the desperate need for two-way friendship and understanding, ran constantly through the old Prime Minister's words that Anglo-American-Russian friendship can save the world. This thought, the desperate need for two-way friendship and understanding, ran constantly through the old Prime Minister's words that Anglo-American-Russian friendship can save the world. Given this friendship between powerful leaders, it becomes then a question of how well understanding penetrates to the bureaucracy of dissimilar governments. The official organs seem to reflect an atmosphere of hope as distinct from compromise. His vesture says unanimity has been achieved on questions on all the Balkans. Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, joint action in Yugoslavia, and even the special problem of Greece. This dangerous peninsula, this powder keg of Europe, they say here, is going to be blown out like a match in the wind. But consider the latest issue of war in the working classes, explaining how Russia insists on her theory of world security league, that each and every member of the big four or five must agree even when the problem affects one or more of them. It's difficult for, to forget, the article says, that not a single member of the League proposed to expel Poland for the capture of Germany, Italy for Abyssinia, but found the necessary vote to expel the Soviet Union for depriving Germany of a vital springboard. Of course, during the present war, our prestige has grown enormously. Our power, resistance, and role in Europe provoked the admiration of entire mankind. But even now, prejudice against us is very much alive. Part of the press, even in allied countries, and about 20 states, possible members of the World Security Organization, haven't found time to establish normal diplomatic relations, thus openly displaying their unfriendly attitude toward the Soviet Union. This is George Moran Moscow, 
Now back to Admiral Radio, New York. And now for a summary of the European picture as viewed from Spain, Admiral takes you to CBS Madrid and Stadler reporting. Considerable concern is expressed here today over the so-called Spanish Reds, who for three weeks have been making raids from France into Spain. A Spanish news report, Dateland Irun, says that the situation continues to be agitated because of infiltration of what it terms communists and anarchists. These groups are said to be armed with guns dropped months ago from Allied planes to the Maquis for use against the Germans. They made their first large-scale raid on October 4th in the Pyrenees frontier province of Navarre. Six or seven hundred Spaniards who had been living in France since the end of the Spanish Civil War came over the mountains. They succeeded in getting quantities of food and cattle before being driven out by regular Franco troops. There were losses on both sides. Today's news report claims that in the latest skirmish, presumably fought in the past few days, the invading Spaniards lost about 100 killed and about the same number of captured. It also says that the raiders passed through the frontier villages in a decidedly revolutionary manner. They distributed propaganda leaflets and shouted, Viva Gil Robles! Gil Robles, now living in Portugal, was a conservative political leader during the Republic. Two of the raiders sneaked into the little fishing port of Santa Rabia, within sight of the Spanish military commander's headquarters and sailed away in a small boat. According to the news report, however, the French authorities at Bayonne ordered the boat returned to Spain. That was Anne Stadler in Madrid. And now for an interview with Rear Admiral Cochran of the Navy's new assault shipping program, Admiral takes you to Washington, Joe McCaffrey reporting. History's greatest armada has been assembled in the Pacific to speed the invasion of the Philippines. During the past week, we have seen put into large-scale operation the pattern for amphibious operations we have worked out after striking and winning smaller islands in the Pacific. Today as our guest, we have Rear Admiral E.L. Cochran, Chief of the Bureau of Ships. Admiral Cochran was present at the Palau operations, and he has just returned from six weeks' inspection in the Pacific area. Admiral, you saw the Paolu operations from the minute the transport set out until our troops stormed ashore. Suppose you tell us briefly about what made the greatest impression on you out there. I was most impressed by two things. First, the perfect coordination of the tremendous forces needed for the operation, and secondly, by the suitability and the reliability of the ships and craft which took part in the landing. In the Palau operation, our LSTs had to start out to the objective days before the main convoy. Then your LSTs were at Palau days ahead of the main naval forces. Not at all. As the result of the careful planning which had been done, each group of our forces arrived at the scene as it was needed. The LSTs needed the head start because of their slower speed. But there is no escaping the fact, now that we are on the offensive, that the enormous distances in the Pacific theater constitute a great advantage on the side of the Japs. In view of that fact, Admiral, what are we doing here at home to help overcome that advantage? We hope to overcome it by spanning the Pacific with a bridge of ships, especially assault ships. Right now, the biggest shipbuilding job we have is the program of assault shipping, APAs and AKAs, which the Navy is carrying on as a joint operation with the Maritime Commission. Admiral, what are APAs and AKAs? The APAs, Attack Troop Transports, carry what we call the combat teams, that is, complete units of Marines or Army troops fully equipped for battle. These ships are designed to, carry, to provide accommodations for the troops and at the same time carry the landing craft and tank gliders needed to get the troops and their equipment to the beaches. The AKAs, attack cargo ships, carry the extra ammunition, vehicles, gasoline, food, medical supplies, in other words, all the equipment and supplies required to keep the combat units going until they have gained a firm toehold on the enemy territory. They're combat loaded, so that the equipment needed first can be unloaded first. For example, tanks and jeeps are loaded last and come out first. You know, it's estimated that from five to ten tons of equipment and supplies must be landed for every fighting marine or soldier who hits the beach. How do these craft operate during an amphibious assault? 
The assault ships operate as part of a task force of which they are the heart. Since the successful landing of the troops and weapons and supplies which they carry constitutes the whole point of the amphibious operation. For their protection, task groups of fighting ships. Battleships, carriers, cruisers, and destroyers go up with the APAs and AKAs to the area of attack. The latter stand offshore, while the big guns and planes of the warships soften up the enemy with a powerful naval and aerial bombardment. Then, after the initial waves of attacking troops have landed in the smaller landing craft, the APAs and AKAs move in toward the beach to facilitating to facilitate disembarking more men and supplies and equipment. How is the assault shipbuilding program progressing? Unfortunately, the job is now lagging behind schedule, due mainly to a lack of manpower. We simply do not have as many workers engaged on the program as we would like to have. If we are going to meet the timetable which has been set up for the operations in the Pacific, every man and woman who is working in this program will have to carry a heavier load to make up for the additional workers who are needed, but whom we've been unable to obtain. This program is the real key to early success in the war in the Pacific. I'm sure, Admiral, that with the Navy's guidance, we'll keep them floating. This is Joe McCaffrey in Washington. I return you to Admiral in New York. For a last-minute summary of the war situation, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. A bulletin just received here at uh, Columbia World News Headquarters tells us that Canadian troops today captured Breskins in the Skeld pocket, which is the only port remaining by which the German troops in that pocket can be reinforced. Also, other forces north of Antwerp took the town of Eschen, four miles below the important road junction of Rosendahl. The Berlin radio tells us that Germans have made an important new retreat before the massive Russian forces in East Prussia's hotly contested Roman ten area. This Berlin report says that German lines south of the Roman Ter Plain and in Roman Ter Forest were withdrawn and an enemy breakthrough was averted. Of course, the Russians haven't told us anything about these advances in East Prussia, which the Germans have been reporting for several days, but the Russians frequently do hold back on those things. Meanwhile, the German radio tells us in a broadcast picked up by CBS shortwave listening station that today is the first day of registration for the so-called Volkssturm, or People's Army. The Berlin station says that the crowds were so great that some of the registration centers had to close at noon. It does seem a little curious that the centers had to close down because there were so many applicants. It sounds like the Central American volunteers who were sent in with a message, please send back the ropes. Now here's Warren Sweeney. After the war, Admiral Radio, America's smart set, will offer many improvements and refinements over pre-war instruments. There will be fuller, more beautiful tone and finer reception made completely noise-free by FM. I know, Mr. Sweeney, that the Admiral is a wonderful radio. But in my new radio, I want a really beautiful piece of furniture. Then by all means, you'll want an Admiral. You'll have a wide choice of models, each superbly styled in beautiful woods, from the most modern to the period type. Yes, you may rest assured your new Admiral will be a beautiful piece of furniture. Well, that sounds fine, Mr. Sweeney. But tell me this. I'm also interested in a radio phonograph with an automatic record changer. Will I be able to get one that's really foolproof? I have a six-year-old at home who gets into everything, and I'm a bit afraid of what his mischievous little fingers may do. You needn't be. Not with an Admiral. The post-war Admiral record changer will be so sturdy in construction, so simple in operation, you might even call it childproof. As you know, Admiral is the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonographs with automatic record changers. Yes, tomorrow's radio phonograph sensation is sure to be an Admiral. For over a full year, the rise in the cost of living has virtually been stopped in its tracks simply because the great majority of American people have cooperated wholeheartedly with our government's anti-inflation program. But the danger of war-generated inflation is still too great to permit any relaxation in our efforts now. Buy only what you need. And when you buy, pay no more than ceiling prices. Pay your ration points in full. Put your extra dollars into war bonds and other savings. By helping to hold down prices today, you can help ensure a stable, prosperous America when the war is won. 
World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set, and post-war makers of Admiral Refrigerators, Admiral Home Freezers, Admiral Electric Ranges. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago 11.